Hello. Today I'll be talking about formalism. In literary theory, in literary criticism, formalism refers to a style of inquiry that focuses almost exclusively on features of the literary text itself, to the exclusion of any biographical, historical, or intellectual context. The name formalism derives from one of the central tenets of, form, of formalist thought, that the form of a work of literature is inherently a part of the text itself. And any attempt to separate the two, the form and content, is fallacious. So by focuses on focusing on literary form, excluding any context, formalists believed that it would be possible to trace the evolution and development of literary forms, and that's thus literature itself. Now, in simple terms, formalists believed that the focus of literary studies should be the text itself and not the author's life or social class. Art is produced according to certain sets of rules and with its own internal logic. New arms of form, art, forms of art thus represent a break with past forms and an introduction of new rules and logic. And the goal of the critic is to examine this feature of art. Now, in the case of literature, the object of reflection is the text's literariness that which makes it a work of art and not a piece of journalism. Now, this attention to the details of the literary text was an attempt on the part of the lit literature, your know, literary studies to turn its, uh, its discipline into a kind of science. Now, there is no one school of formalism and the term groups together uh, a number of different approaches to literature, many of which, you know, seriously diverge from one another. Formalism in the broadest sense, you know, uh, was the dominant mode of academic literary study in the United States and United Kingdom, I would say from the end of the Second World War till the 1970s. And particularly, the formalism of the new critics, uh, including among others, I.A. Richards, John Crow Ransom, C.P. Snow, T. and T.S. Eliot. Now on the European continent, formalism emerged primarily out of the Slavic intellectual circles of Prague and Moscow and particularly out of the work of uh, Roman Jacobson uh, and Boris Eichenbaum and Viktor Sholovsky. Now, although theories of Russian formalism and new criticism are similar in a number of ways or in a number of respects, the two schools largely developed in isolation from each other and should not be conflated are considered identical. In reality, even many of the theories proposed by critics, you know, working together within their own respective circle, often diverge from one another. Now, beginning in the late 1970s, formalism began to fall out of favor in the scholarly community, you know, a number of new approaches, which often emphasize the political importance of literary texts, begin to, you know, th th these discourses began to dominate the field and the theorists became suspicious of the idea that a literary work, you know, could be separated from its historical origins, you know, or from the background of political and social context. So for a number of decades following the early 1970s, the word formalism, you know, took on a negative 
almost pejorative uh, connotation, denoting works of literary criticism, you know, that were so absorbed in meticulous reading as to have no larger cultural relevance. In recent years, as the wave of post-structuralism and post-modernism criticism has itself, you know, begun to dissipate, the value of formalist methods has again come to light. And some believe that the future of literary criticism will involve some form of resurgence of formalist ideas. Now, Russian formalism refers primarily to the work of the Society for the Study of Poetic Language, which was founded in 1916 in St. Petersburg, which was then called Petrograd, you know, by Boris Eichenbaum, Viktor Sholovsky, and Yuri Tainanov, and secondarily to the Moscow Linguistic Circle, you know, founded in 1914 by Roman Jakobson. Okay. Um, I, in, in the essay, in, in the theory of the formal method, uh, is the one that provides an economical overview of the approach the formalist advocated, you know, which included some basic ideas. For example, the aim, I mean, this is I kind of suggesting the aim is to produce a science of literature that would be both independent and factual. Since literature is made of language, linguistics will be a foundational element of the science of literature. Then literature is autonomous from external conditions in the sense that literary language is distinct from ordinary uses of language, not least because it is not entirely communicative. Literature has its own history, a history of innovation in formal structures and is not determined by external material history. And what a work of literature says cannot be separated from how the literary work says it. And therefore the form and structure of a work from, from being merely the decorative wrapping of the content is in fact an integral part of the content of the work. Now, according to Eichenbaum, Shalovsky was the head or the lead critic of the group, and Shalovsky contributed two of their most well-known concepts, defamiliarization, right, which uh, can be also translated as estrangement or making it strange, and the plot slash story distinction. Now, defamiliarization is one of the crucial ways in which literary language distinguish its, distinguishes itself, you know, from ordinary communicative language and speech, and is a feature of how art in general functions by presenting things in strange and new ways, right, that allow the reader to see the world in a different light. So innovation in literary history is, according to Shulovsky, partly a matter of finding new techniques of defamiliarization. Okay, now the plot and story distinction, the second aspect of uh, literary evolution, you know, according to Shulovsky, is the distinction between the sequence of events the text relates, which is the story, from the sequence in which those events are presented in the work, the plot, right? By emphasizing how the plot of any fiction naturally diverges from the chronological sequence of its story, Shalovsky was able to emphasize the importance of 
know, paying an extra or an extraordinary amount of attention to the plot that is the form of a text so as to understand its meaning right both of these concepts are attempts to describe the significance of the form of a literary work right in order to define its literariness right you'll point to these now the prague circle you know, uh, is connected to structuralism and the Moscow linguistic circle. Both were founded by Roman Jacks Jacobson. And they were more directly concerned with recent developments in linguistics. Then Eichenbaum's group, you know, um, Jack Jacobson left Moscow for Prague in 1920 and in 1926 co founded the Prague linguistic circle. Now, together with Nikolai uh, Trubetsky and others, they combined an interest in literary theory, right? With an interest in literary theory with an interest in linguistics, and especially the work of Saussure. You now, the clearest and most important example of Prague school uh, structuralism lies in its treatment of. Uh, phony or phonemics, right? Rather than simply compile a list of which sounds occur in a language, the Prague School, you know, led by Jacobson, sought to examine how they were related. Influenced by Saussurean linguistics, they determined that the inventory of sounds in a language, you know, could be analyzed in terms of a series of contrasts. Jacobson's work on linguistics and, you know, in, in Saussure especially, uh, proved seminal and more important for the development of structuralism. Like his move from Prague to France, uh, when he moved there, served to help catalyze the, its development there, the development of structuralism. Now, another important figure is, is I.A. Richards, right? He was born on February 26, 1893, died in 1979, and he was an influential literary critic and rhetorician, right? Who, of, who, was, who was often cited as the founder of, you know, Anglophone school of formalist criticism that, that would eventually become, you know, known as the new criticism. Now, Richards, you know, his books, especially The Meaning of Meaning, you know, Principles of Literary Criticism, uh, Practical Criticism, and The Philosophy of Rhetoric. Uh, these were seminal documents, not only uh, for the development of new criticism, right, but also for the field of semiotics, the philosophy of language and linguistics. Moreover, you know, Richards was an accomplished teacher and most of the eminent new critics that were Richards' students at one time or the other, I mean, they were. And since the new criticism, at least in, you know, English speaking countries is often thought of as the beginning of modern literary criticism. You know, Richards is, uh, could be considered one of the founders of the contemporary study of literature in English. Um, what else can I say? Um, so, he, you know, he's the father of kind of new criticism. Um, and as the new criticism was largely the product of his students, who extended, reinterpreted, and in some cases misinterpreted Richard's more general theories of language, right? And al although Richard's was a literary critic, he was trained as a philosopher, right? And it is important to note that his own theories of literature were primarily carried out to further a philosophical theory of language itself, you know, rather than as a critical theory of literature. 
Richards is perhaps most famous for uh, an anecdote which he reproduced in, in practical criticism, uh, illustrating his style of critical reading. And we have heard of that as, you know, as a classroom assignment. Richards uh, would give his undergraduates short poems, stories, uh, or passages from longer works without indicating you know, who the authors were. And then he discovered that pretty much all of his students, even the ones who were most advanced, exceptional, and sophisticated, were utterly at a loss to interpret a sonnet of Shakespeare, let's say, without relying on the cliches drawn from Shakespeare's biography and style. So in attempting to you know, ascertain why his students had such difficulty in interpreting literary text without the aid of biographical and historical you know, commonplaces, Richard hit upon his method of extremely um, close reading of the text, you know, forcing his students to pay an almost, you know, capacious degree of attention to the precise wording of a text, right? So in addition to developing the method of close reading, you know, this which would eventually become the foundation of formalist criticism, uh, especially new criticism, Richards was also deeply invested in understanding uh, literary interpretation, you know, from the perspective of psychoanalysis and psychology, which a lot of people don't realize. I mean, he was read, well read in the psychological theory of his day, you know, uh, and helping to further the development of psychoanalytical criticism which would ultimately surpass new criticism, you know, when it's embraced by most of his students. So while Richard's theories of poetic interpretation and poetic language have been surpassed, like, you know, his initial impulse to ground a theory of interpretation in psychology and textual analysis has become the paradigm um, for the development of the, you know, wherever literary criticism is taught, it's part of the curriculum. So new criticism coming to that was the new dominant trend in English and American literary studies of criticism uh, of the mid 20th century, like from the 1920s to the mid 1960s. Now, its, its adherents were, you know, empathetic in or emphatic in their advocacy of close reading and attention to text themselves. Right? And their rejection of criticism based on extra textual, textual sources, you know, especially biography, that's, they absolutely didn't want to do that. And at their best, new critical readings were, you know, brilliant, articulately argued and broad in spoke, scope. But at their worst, the new criticism, you know, sounded pedantic and idiosyncratic and at times dogmatic in their refusal to invest or investigate other contextual avenues of critical inquiry. So as a result of these failings, uh, the new critics were ev eventually usurped by the development of post-structuralism, deconstruction, you know, uh, post-colonialism, right, and cultural studies, and more politically oriented schools of literary theory. But new criticism became a byword or backwards model of conducting literary, you know, research that paid no attention to anything outside the small word of a closed text, you know, when Literature, literary studies became political. Um, and and, and now, and in, in, within an increasingly complex and chaotic academic environment, um, the academy itself has turned back to re examine some of the more open minded and incisive works of new critics, 
you know, although new criticism has rarely been taught in classrooms, I mean, it's still taught as a, an approach since the 1970s. In recent years, it has begun to make its resurgence, you know, into the critical discourse. Now, some of its main um, attributes, you know, uh, even though they are often thought of as a school, it is important to note that due to key ideological differences, you know, among some of its most prominent scholars and members, uh, new criticism never became, a, a, you know, an, an, a unified science of literature. Uh, the major critics were often grouped together as being the leaders or seminal figures of new criticism, uh, R.T.S. Eliot, F.R. Lewis, William Ampson, Robert Penn Warren, John Crow Ransom, right, and Cleanth Brooks, even Bradsley and Wimsett. It is worthwhile to note that the new criticism was rather unique because, you know, a sizable number of practicing new critics were also active as poets, novelists, and short story writers. While almost all literary critics today are exclusively, you know, scholars and academics, they don't do poetry and fiction also. And although difficult to summarize, it is sufficient to say that new criticism resembled the formalism of I.A. Richards, okay? And in that, that it focused on a meticulous analysis of the literary text right, to the exclusion of outside details. In particular, the notion of the ambiguity of literary language, right? And it's an important concept within new criticism. Now, several prominent new critics, you know, have been particularly fascinated with the way that a text can display um, multiple simultaneous meanings. Uh, in the 30s, I.A. Richards borrowed Sigmund Freud's term overdetermination, right, to refer to the multiple, multiple meanings which he believed were always simultaneously present in language. So to Richards, claiming that a work has one and only one true meaning was an, was an act of superstition. Right? And he says that in the philosophy of rhetoric, page 39. Right? So in 54, Wimsatt and Monroe Bradsley published an essay, you know, which is very famous, the intentional fallacy, right? It, it, it would become a watershed text in the development of new criticism. Not I teach it, right? Now this essay argued strongly against any discussion of an author's intention or, you know, intended meaning. For Wimsett and Bradsley, uh, the words on the page were all that mattered. The, the reader, has no privileged access into the author's mind, right, to determine uh, what the author intended. The importance, uh, importation of meanings from outside the text was quite irrelevant, right? That's why intentional fallacy, not to read intentional. Uh, so this became a central tenet of new criticism, excluding the authorial intention and other contexts. So since the new criticism admitted no information other than that contained in the text, right, no proper new critical investigation, therefore, should include biographical information you know, on the author. Furthermore, studying a passage of prose or poetry in new critical style requires careful, exacting scrutiny of the passage itself a very rigid attitude for which the new, new critics have often been, um, you know, reproached in later times. However, close reading is now a fundamental tool of literary criticism, you know, uh, and such a reading uh, 
it places great emphasis on the particular over the general, you know, paying close attention to individual words, syntax, even punctuation, and the order in which sentences and images, you know, unfold as they are read, even in our times. The excruciatingly exact style of reading advocated by neocriticism, you know, has is, it's jokingly referred to as analyzing the daylights out of a poem uh, before 30 stupefied undergraduate students, but that's what you are required to do. And despite the numerous flaws of an exclusively uh, new critical approach, the new critics were one, I mean, they were one of the most successful schools of literary theory in the, you know, in the brief history of literary studies. Now, in the hundred or so years that literature has been taken seriously as an academic discipline you know, within the university, and you can watch my lecture on the rise of English, uh, the new critics are probably the most influential. And, and they were obviously the longest lasting of all critical schools. Um, it was not until political and ideological turbulent decades of the 60s and 70s uh, that the methods of the new critics <coughs> were questioned. And in the wake of their downfall, literary theory has never had a unified system um, of literary analysis that it had during the time uh, of new criticism. Now, Current schools are beginning to reevaluate the methods of the new critics uh, in order to apply uh, them to the broader fields of <coughs> excuse, culturally and politically relevant, relevant criticism that have emerged. And it is clear that many of the ideas of the new critics and those of formalist at large are far from you know, obsolete they still work. So, you know, what are my concluding thoughts on this? <coughs> Excuse me. So formalism, a focus on the form, right, has two um, correlated systems of literary criticism, of which <coughs> um, Russian formalism is one and new criticism is one. So they should not be conflated. No, the Russian formalists and then the later Prague school focused on the work itself, work of art, the text, lit literary text itself. And the reason was that they were very skeptical of bringing in any outside information, any uh, biographical information they were objecting to the romantic biographical criticism that preceded them. And then as you move into Roman Jacobson, formalism becomes more and more informed by theories of linguistic, especially Saussurean linguistic. But the main concept is that literature is estranging, defamiliarizing, and it is that language made strange in a poem that makes the reader pause and think about the poem itself or about the world. I mean, it's that movement into a literary text and the estranging language and that has, so one of the roles of the literary text is defamiliarization people from the everyday monotony of life, the automation of life. And Eagleton has some beautiful passages on it in his first chapter, um, what is literature introduction to his literary theory. And I have a lecture on it, which you should please watch. And then we moved on to new criticism. It's rise as practical criticism in England with the father figure as I.A. Richards, F.R. Lewis and other in the scrutiny group. And then it's rise in the US Academy, especially as led by John Crow Ransom, Ransom who has a wonderful article called Critical Criticism Incorporated, which you should also read. But overall, an emphasis on the text, close reading, 
and an emphasis on the form. How does form shape the content of a text? And a complete exclusion of anything outside the text, history, culture, politics, authorial biography. What you're literally doing is reading the form linguistically or otherwise through an understanding of the form and what the language does, what devices are used by the poet, how does a poet resolve the tensions within the poem. And you're focused on the form and the literary devices used in a poem or in a short story. And that in a nutshell is kind of two schools of formalistic literary criticism, formalistic Russian formalism and American new criticism. And that is all I have uh, today. Um, I will come back for more. Uh, meanwhile, thank you so much for joining me and I will see you next time.